Hello. Is it on? Good. This one's on, I think. Good evening. I know you're enjoying the wonderful meal, but I'd love for you to continue your conversations, but in a quieter way, because we have a dynamic speaker for you. Uh, continue to eat quietly, you know how your mother said. Make sure you don't smack, okay? So just keep eating quietly. We have uh, for our keynote for this luncheon, Dr. Julianne Malveaux, who is a renowned journalist, um, <laughs> economist, and, and author, and she is going to give us some really important salient points that's going to help us move our national action plan forward. So thank you, continue eating, and Julianne. Well, good afternoon, everybody. If you're not eating, you've got to holler back at me because, you know, we do call a response in the hood. So good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you. Now I know you're awake, and I know that everybody's going to get their post-meal nap because uh, that's what we do. But meanwhile, we're really not um, going to sleep. So I am not a physician, and I don't play one on TV. Sometimes I play lawyer. But um, health care, as you know, is one of our nation's most pressing economic issues, and I am an economist. Um, Health care takes up one seventh, 14% of our GDP, between 14 and 16% of our GDP. And as my generation, the baby boom ages, more and more of us are going to require different kinds of health care. So we're looking at a business perspective. What we're looking at is um, increased need for all kinds of things, occupational therapists, nursing homes, all of that. So this is a really, I'm really happy to be here. I'm happy that Doris invited me. And you all have a dynamo as your president. You all are very blessed and highly favored to have this woman uh, lead you. You know, I used to be on a board with her. And at the end of our board meetings, she would give us health lectures. She would tell us, watch your sodium. Um, I mean, it had nothing to do with anything that had to do with the board. But she, I, I guess she just felt compelled to ensure that all of us lived a long time. So she shared all of our little, you know, and I'm diabetic. Um, I don't act like it half the time, but I am. And she would say, and you don't need to eat all that fruit. She would say it to me right to my face as I'm eating all that fruit. Um, but you know that this is somebody who's dedicated to our health and to the issue of health equity and health disparities, and this is a really huge problem in our country. Now, the first thing I want to do is shout out President Obama. Because, yes, the 2016 uh, numbers on income, poverty, and health came out last Wednesday, so a week ago. And what they showed us was that 93% of white people 92% of Asian Americans, 89.5% of African Americans, and 84% of Latinos have health insurance coverage. These are tremendous numbers. The Latino population was way underrepresented. The number was something in the 40s at the beginning, the beginning of President Obama's term. So it was literally able to double their representation. Our numbers were better, but now almost 90% of us have health coverage. But we now have a challenge. Now, some of y'all are probably Republicans. That's OK, because I'm going to go home when I'm finished talking. Um, but you know, I, I, I used to call that man the orange orangutan until a Sora of mine, who was a veterinarian, wrote me a letter. And she said that I should not disparage orangutans. Because after all, they were very nice animals. So I just call it 45 now. Plus, I was also told by someone at MSNBC that it was unprofessional for me to call the man a orangutan. I thought, I told him, I said, but it's a compliment, see? Um, anyway, neither here nor there. He came in saying he was going to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act. And let's call it what it is. It's the Affordable Care Act. When you put President Obama's name on top of it, people get cray-cray. Because these people, anything that the President Obama had done, they're trying to take away. 
I mean, from my work as a labor economist, as an example, President Obama signed an executive order that said that you had to report, if you had more than 100 employees, the wages of your employees by race and gender. So we could begin to quantify the gender gap and the racial income gap. Uh, 45 essentially reversed that. Um, he's reversed any number of things that President Obama has done. But this new effort, after having failed, they're trying now again to pass a health care bill. They have to do it by the 30th, otherwise they have to get 60% of the Senate. Um, and they're trying to do that, and it's really very frightening. And it actually affects, for those of you who are in private practice especially, but even those of you who work for uh, HMOs, it really does affect your ability to make a living. Because essentially, reversing means that you go back to having patients who cannot afford you and not having insurance. And understand this, one third, fully one third of the African American population earns less than $25,000 a year. Fully one third. That's a scary statistic. Among African American women who had, had households, the number is even higher. It's almost 40% of African American women who had households earn less than $25,000 a year. And that was in 2016. So this, this is very recent data. But what we, so what we have to do, I hope that Doris, and I know she will, because she's so wonderful, I know you all need to begin your work on lobbying. I don't care whether your representatives are Democrats or Republicans. <laughs> you need to begin to tell them why it makes sense to strengthen the Affordable Care Act, not rescind it. The act is not perfect. As I said, you know, we could have, we could be 100% or the African American community could be as large as the white community with 93%. It's not perfect, but it's better than what we used to have. And so these representatives, including Paul Ryan, need to hear from people, and especially from people in the medical professions, that this makes no sense. The reason why you had those votes in the Senate, including John McCain, John McCain gets blue chip, you know, blue chip health care. He got a brain tumor, but he also has a medical insurance from the United States government. He don't have to worry about it. Meanwhile, I have a, my former assistant, when I was at Bennett College, needs a hip replacement. Her copay is $1,200 for a hip replacement, um, which is crazy. She has health insurance from North Carolina A&T State University, but her copay for the health for the hip replacement is $1,200. She makes $35,000 a year. She's trying to figure out, she's like, can I do a GoFundMe page? I'm like, no, maybe I'll help you with it. I don't want anybody going to do a GoFundMe page for a hip replacement, that's kind of embarrassing. Um, I mean, do a GoFundMe page for a business or something like that. But in any case, the, what, what has now been proposed is unacceptable, and you all need to be the voices to hear that, because so many of our people don't have voices. And you do. So many of our people just take it and they squirm. But, but you have the opportunity to lift your voice and you have the credibility with those MD and I, some of y'all have the other letters behind it, FACPS, I don't know what that means. Um, but I know some of my friends have it. Um, so I guess they like even more highly medical than medical. Um, and Floyd Malvo is my cousin, the former dean at uh, Howard Med School. And every now and then he tells me to stop pretending I'm ignorant. I'm like, I ain't ignorant, but Y'all get too many letters, you know? Like, your know, whole business card got letters on it. Um, all the way across the thing. Um, you know, all I got is PhD, what can I say? Um, but in any case, so we gotta we'll look at um, the healthcare in terms of two things. We wanna look at it in terms of its impact on the economy. Number two, the number one cause of bankruptcy is what? Healthcare, people go bankrupt, they can't pay their doctor bills, and that's how they go bankrupt. The, the, the number one group of people who go bankrupt because of health care is what? Single moms. And many of these women often make a decision, and you've seen these cases. I was on the board of the United Medical Center until the mayor threw me off. Um, I get thrown out of all kinds of places. It's really a shame. Why do people keep throwing me out of places? But I told her, I said, hell, I've been thrown off of better places than this, so I'm not really tripping. Um, and I heard there was somebody from Paladin here. But anyway, I'm not going to go there. Um, not going to go there. Um, but UMC, I mean, basically needs to have a budget line 
in the district budget because it is the public hospital for wards seven and eight. Instead, because of financial issues, they just had to close the maternity ward. So women in ward seven and eight do not have any place that they can get maternal care. They gotta come across the river to get maternal care. And again, these are issues that we need to basically advocate around. But what I would say is having been on that board, um, the, the issue of collections became a huge issue. People didn't pay. They, why didn't they pay? They didn't have any money. And if people start hounding people, that's a source of stress. So you all are key delivery providers in terms of this, and you all need to step up. I'm sure many of you have already stepped up, but I'm gonna ask you to do just a little more. And work with Doris, because of what I know she's doing is bringing together health professionals across the board. So the nurses and the psychologists and you know all the folks who basically deal with our health. Because we really do need to understand how our people are becoming more unhealthy. Now there are two areas that especially concern me. And I told someone earlier, I said, Meharry actually was so convinced that I was uh, a health economist that they hired me to work for them for a week. They didn't hire me to come back though. Um, again, got thrown out someplace. Um, but anyway, no, they, I had a great time and I think I learned more than people learned from me, but I went down for a week in their summer institute to teach health policy. And um, so I, I, I stay on top of these issues, but the two areas where we don't pay enough attention are dental health and mental health. I mean, we, we, we look at, did you get a checkup, blah, 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 but dental health and mental health are two of the areas that we have to pay far more attention to. First of all, if you're not cray cray and you black in America, you really cray cray. You know, I mean, if you are black in this white supremacist country, you really are having a problem. I'm gonna tell y'all a story. Cause my doctor told me I had Trump related stress syndrome. <laughs> well, here's what happened. I was in Atlanta on January 3rd. I have family in Atlanta and we celebrate New Year's Day together, we, last day at Kwanzaa. So, you know, I have been well hugged, well fed, well drunk, all that good stuff. I was happy as a clam till I get to the airport, sit at my gate, and then comes this big old white boy, big old white boy. I mean, they had trained him in the mountains or something, cause he was about six, eight, and he was thick. And he had on a Make America Great Again t-shirt and a Make America Great Again cap. All right, so I'm ignoring him because I mean, you can put whatever you want to on your body. Like I told someone the other day, I once bought me some Confederate flag toilet paper. And y'all know why. So that's what I think of the Confederate flag. Every time, you know, I went to the restroom, I was like, yes. <laughs> and I usually use it more for number two than one. <laughs> for any number of reasons. But anyway. So you put whatever you want to on your body, that's your business. But then a lovely black woman uh, came, on to the, came into the boarding area, and I would call her older, except for I'd be 64 on Friday. See, I ain't shamed because I don't look 64. So if I look 64, I wouldn't tell nobody. But since I don't look it, I tell it all the time. And I wasn't supposed to be alive, alive this long because I started more mess in my life than most people could finish. And a couple times I have been confronted with firearms. Um, but in any case, so I can't call the sister older, but she had gray dreads. And she had a beautiful Obama t-shirt on, you know the one that's a black t-shirt that has a whole family on it. And she had a little girl with her that I assumed was her granddaughter, who also had the Obama t-shirt on. So then big old white boy starts talking about Obama in words. And he's real loud, and he's real big. And usually I will say something, but I'm looking at him saying, he's bigger than me. Uh, I can't win this fight. So I went over to the, uh, or if it was a regular person, I would have said something to him. I went over to the uh, gate agent, I said, he's using hate speech, y'all need to do something about that. She says, well, what do you want me to do? I said, call security. So security came, the black guy and the white guy, and they tried to talk to the man, and he kept saying he had free speech, and he said, all I said was in. And the brother said, say it one more time, or we're gonna escort you out of the airport. I'm like, yes, <laughs> okay. We get on the plane. Ordinarily, I would not upgrade myself from Atlanta to DC, but they gave me a courtesy upgrade. I guess they would try to, I don't know, keep me happy because I was gonna write Delta Airlines a letter on that ticket agent. And, um, but anyway, I end up sitting behind this fool <laughs> who is well behaved until the sister gets on again 
with her child. Then he starts that N-word stuff again. So I called, put the flight attendant call button, and the woman said he has the right to free speech. I said, let me see the pilot. So the pilot came out. He wasn't black, but he was about my complexion, so he was something. I mean, <laughs> you know, he wasn't white. <laughs> and I told him what happened, and he kept saying, really, really? I said, yes. I said, I'm very uncomfortable. He said, do you want to take a later flight? I said, no, I want him to take a later flight. So he said, okay. So he gets the guy off. Guy gets off, and they blah, blah, blah. And he gets back on. And the idiot has the nerve to turn around, look me dead in the face, and say, I'm sorry I said in. I put the call button again, and then the flight attendant came, and she told him, she said, that's the last time you will say this word on this flight. If you say it again, we are going to escort you off the plane. Do we have an agreement? So then he said yes. But he, every day, two minutes, he turned around and looked at me like I was afraid of him, frankly. And I was afraid of too many people, but I didn't have my firearm because you can't get them on the plane. And, uh, you know, I have, I, my brother has a friend that sometimes uh, escorts me. He's about 7'2", and he's ugly. And uh, I love running with him because he's 7'2", and ugly. And all he got to do is look at you, and you ain't going to mess with nobody. But I didn't have him with me either. So um, I'm like, uh-oh, we're going to have a problem. Do you know that literally I upchucked from Atlanta to D.C.? And I had eaten extremely healthily. I had had like two boiled eggs and a piece of turkey and some salad for breakfast. Now everybody doesn't eat salad for breakfast, but I eat weird. Um, I, the day, I called my doctor as soon as I got back, because since I'm diabetic, you know, if weird things happen, you're supposed to call the doctor. So I called her up and she said, well, what happened? I told her, no, I, she said, what did you eat? I said, you know, I ate regular. She said, yeah, well, you know, salad for breakfast is kind of weird. I said, yeah, but you know I'm weird, so don't worry about it. Um, and then she said, well, had you been drinking the day before? I said, well, hell, you know, I had a couple glasses of wine, but I mean, I ain't tied one on anything, didn't pass out. Uh, so <laughs> it wasn't a hangover. So she said, well, um, did you eat any old food? I said, no. Um, I said, I, don't, I didn't eat any old food. She said, so tell me what happened. And then I told her, she said, you have trump related stress syndrome. And she said that lots of people are having weird health syndrome symptoms because of that food. You know, so all I'm saying is the mental health piece is really important. I started back to see my therapist over that man. Um, she was so happy to see me coming because she's so expensive. I was, I had cut her loose. <laughs> I had cut her loose. I'm like, you know, I know I'm crazy, but $300 an hour, sister, please. You know, I just be crazy with myself. You know, <laughs> write it down in my journal, get it out. But you know, I had to go back because you know, it's like, you know, got back on my antidepressants because you know, that shit will make you, excuse my language, that shit will make you depressed. You know, when you look at what's happening in that, I call it the people's house now because I can't call it the White House because white supremacy is too overwhelming. So I just call it the people's house because it is the people's house. We pay for it. Um, but in any case, the mental health piece, we need to pay more attention to. And we as black people tend not to pay attention to it. You tell somebody you're depressed, girl, you need to go see your pastor. Now, your pastor does not have a degree in anything. I mean, he might have a divinity degree, might. You know, because some of these storefront pastors, I don't know where they've been. Um, uh, you know, but anyway, not to diss pastors much. But um, all I'm saying is physicians need to pay attention to signals of depression, mental illness, bipolarity, and other things, and often refer their patients to an affordable therapist. The dental health piece is really important also, especially for our children. You have people who are poor. We, we, what we've just learned in DC from a recent report is that some of the food programs run out in the second week, which means the last two weeks people do not have food assistance. So you have people who are not well educated, and they could be high income or low income to be not well educated, and they're giving their babies juice, Coke, Fanta Orange, um, as opposed to water, milk and other things. So these children are set up to have rotten mouths and your, your dental health is associated with your overall health. But again, this is something that we don't pay enough attention to. So I'm imploring you, and Doris knows she's, I asked the dental people, I, I hope the dentists are here, but she's asked the dental people to partner with her and others to partner with her to look at some of these issues because they are extremely important. What we know when we look at all of this stuff, the way that I talk about the whole health issue is I call it the three A's. And the three A's are access, 
assets and attitudes. Access, where can people go to get health care? What we now know here in the District of Columbia is that the poorest people in this district have nowhere to go or have a place to go that they get limited help. And what, unfortunately, the United Medical Center has a horrible reputation. When Mayor Vince Gray put me on the board, a friend of mine said, I wouldn't serve on that board. I wouldn't send my dog there. I'm like, oh, that's horrible. So we did embark on a PR campaign. They have some medical equipment there that no one else has in the city. It's really actually a good hospital. The maternity thing, I think, is overblown. But in any case, lots of folks don't have access to medical care. And while DC is not unusual in terms of inner city or where poor folks live, rural people also have this challenge in terms of access. The second issue is assets. How much money do you have? Can you pay your co-pays? Some people think the co-pays, I don't, you know, my co-pays are 20 and 40, and I think if I get a specialist, it's 50. Um, you know, I mean, I'm not throwing money away, but if I need to go to the doctor, I will go to the doctor. But a lot of people look at that copay and say, I can't go because the copay is too high. I just told you that a third of all African American households have less than $25,000 in income. So the assets issue becomes extremely important. But then the third issue is one where you can educate your melanin deficient colleagues. And that would be attitudes. Y'all know what I mean by melanin deficient, right? Okay. I don't always like to call white folks white folks. Sometimes I just call them melanin deficient. Um, the Institutes of Medicine did a report that said that black men in particular were less likely to get painkillers when they had a broken bone than white folks were because people assumed, doctors in emergency rooms assumed that they wanted the painkillers for other reasons. Well now, if you have a broken bone, you need painkillers for any reason. I mean, even if you are a junkie, you need painkillers with a broken bone. I'll tell you, I broke my arm and it was, it was cute. Then they had to re-break it. They gave me some really good painkillers. They gave me some, some they had to, t they taped it to me. Oh man, that, that was the best high I had in life. Uh, I, was, I went back to the doctor, I said, can I get some more? She's like, no. I said, please, this stuff is good. It was, it was so good that they, they, they made me stop answering the phone in my office because I cussed out one of my clients. But what had happened was, <laughs> it was some trifling people who didn't want to pay me, but my mama made me work for them. Cause they're in there, and I figured I would work for them because they were in San Francisco. At least I'd give me about three or four trips home. So she said, oh, Julianne, come on, you could be nice. Them cheap people told me I could Skype in my report. So I'm like, nah, I ain't doing that. But they didn't tell me that on a regular day. They told me on the day when I had them good painkillers. So I asked them, were they Maryland farming crazy? Because I had the good painkillers. I know how to edit myself when I don't have good painkillers. But you know, you cannot make chicken salad out of chicken spit. And you know, if you, if you, you cannot get orange juice out of an apple. So you know, you're not going to get good behavior out of me when y'all have painkillers. I mean, it just wasn't going to happen. Uh, so my assistant then said, I'm taking the phone out of your room, I'm taking the phone, uh, you, you cannot answer the phone anymore. I'm like, oh well. But in any case, um, what we know is that many physicians have attitudes about their patients that are racially tinged. That some people will not get painkillers, that oftentimes our aches and pains are seen as in your head when they're not. I have a friend who actually for years was telling her doctor that she had all these pains and she, the doctor said that she, you know, was emotional. Turned out she had gout. You know, she had gout and gout will give you aches and pains. But the doctor was not paying her any mind. What I, I referred her to a sister and the sister said, oh no, 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 no. She took her blood levels and all that. She said, she has gout. I'm like, okay. So you can help educate your colleagues about their attitudes toward their patients. And some of y'all can check yourselves too, because some of y'all got attitudes. When somebody low income comes in, when someone who's not so well dressed comes in, I went to doctor for I went to the podiatrist. My doctor told me to go. At that particular day, I happened to wear a hoodie and a cap, which I'm usually not seen in the streets with. But uh, it was just one of them days. I'm like, this is not a cute day. Don't take my picture. 
the lady said to me, can I see your Medicaid card? <laughs> now, you know, I read her. I asked her what the bluff was wrong with her. Had she lost her mind? Had she checked it in somewhere? I said, how dare you assume? She said, well, you know, she said, I know a Julianne Malvo. It's a Dr. Julianne Malvo. You don't look anything like her. I said, but I is her. <laughs> I mean, I was looking bad that day, I'll admit it. My girl say, can I see your Medicaid card? I am like, which please? And it wasn't which either. Um, but in any case, so some of us need to check our attitudes too about how we're treating people. And whether they're low income or not, everybody deserves reasonable medical care. The reason we end up with the health disparities we have is because of the access because of the issue of assets, but also because of attitudes. And we don't have to have those attitudes. They are not necessary. We just real, you all, I mean, are here as physicians, essentially to heal people. And the healing can't happen if you have biases against the people who you're attempting to heal. So we have a lot of work to do around health equity. We have a lot of work to do around health education. I hope that all of your offices have information for your patients so people can learn more about healthy eating. Doris Brown, I know I don't see mac and cheese down there, but I'm gonna give me some. <laughs> but you heard me say, but I'm gonna give me some. Um, but about healthy eating, about the, the, the food pyramid, all of those things, we consume an awful lot of sodium. It's correlated with high blood pressure. You know, the black people diseases, high blood pressure. And they call it the sugar diabetes. I don't know. I'm the skinniest person in my family. I am the skinniest person in my family. I got a sister who's size 26, size 24, size 18. I'm a 10. How come I'm the one who got the diabetes? That ain't fair. I mean, that is so unfair. God does, has a sick sense of humor. I've been lording over them all the time. You know what? Well, I'm healthy. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> God said, I'm going to show you sister, how healthy you are, which is a good thing because it makes me eat pretty healthy. I'm going to give you some of that mac and cheese, um, <laughs> especially with the hot sauce down there. Um, but anyway, I hope that all of your offices are educational centers. I hope that all of you are doing the extra step in terms of educating your patients, and I hope that all of you are lobbyists and activists around what our government is attempting to do around health. You don't have anything, people always say, if you don't have your health. And we know that that's the case. I don't care how much money you have. I don't care how much status you have. If you're sickly, if you're sick, it's a problem. And so the work that Doris is doing to get all these organizations together to really deal with this issue of health equity and this health gap that we see is so very important. We know that African-American women in particular, that more than half of us are overweight and about 25% of us are obese. That's frightening. But then one of my fat sisters, I mean, I called her one day, I said, what you doing, Mariette? And she's a single mom, and she has issues. I said, what you doing, Mariette? She said, I'm eating the cheesecake. I said, surely you mean a slice of cheesecake. <laughs> she said, no, I just broke up with whomever, the flavor of the month, and I'm depressed. So I'm eating the cheesecake. I said, do me a favor. She said, what? I said, put that sucker in the freezer and go get you some carrots. She said, carrots don't help out with my depression. I said, oh well. So, but we, we tend, so many black women self-medicate. And that self-medication is often food. And so we need to check our sisters when they come in. We need to check our friends and say, like Doris did at the board meeting, although I didn't appreciate. Um, check our friends and say to them, what's going on? You all have the power of black life in your hands. And black lives matter only when black health matters. So I love my millennial youngins who are out there marching and talking about black lives matter. But when I look at what they eat, I'm like, your life really doesn't matter to you, brother or sister, if you eat like that. So we have a lot of work to do. Again, I'm thrilled, privileged, and honored to be here with you. I hope you got a little something out of this talk. Remember the three A's. Remember that President Obama did more for healthcare than anyone has done since FDR. That's important for us to continue to remember. And once we've had the healthcare we've had, we can't go back 
we won't go back, we will be a healthy nation, and we will be a healthy black people, That's right. but only with your help. Thank you very much. Dr. Brown has asked me to answer a few questions. There was a young man back there, the mayor of a city in Alabama, who wanted to ask a question as a mic. Hi. At the right time. Oh, thank you. Well, you're a mayor, so I know how y'all are. I appreciate the introduction. Uh, well, you know, what I wanted to say, I, Brandon Dean. I'm Brandon Dean. I'm the mayor of Brighton, Alabama, which is right outside of Birmingham. I'm also a Howard University alumni. I see several Howard, one of our wonderful, resplendent trustees, a fellow alumni, Matt, right here. Um, and my, my statement was simple, uh, or my concern, rather, uh, is that we have an audience here. And just as you made an assessment to uh, the responsibility that medical practitioners, people in this field, have to lobby, to advocate, for the interest of people in particular communities, particularly those that look like us, um, uh, forcefully going to Republicans, going to Democrats on the Hill to speak up for the need to address uh, health care policy that's imbalanced, that's not having an appropriate effect on these communities. There are communities like mine where citizens are fortunate, I, should, I guess I could say, to have a, a, a MIA leader who invites this type of interest, this type of investment. And so those places do exist. And, I, and, I, and, and, and my, my concern is that when you talk about the lack of access to quality foods, when you talk about uh, the lack of attention to mental health, when you talk about preventative, uh, preventative health care being uh, at a premium in places, uh, th those are all representative of the demographics and dynamics that characterize my community. And the unfortunate part about it is a uh, hundred year old city. Uh, the, since the 1970s, uh, having predominant African American leadership, it wasn't until 2016 that a discussion about those things uh, started. And so now, uh, as someone with a platform, as someone with a position, as someone with a voice, I'm inviting people just like you in this room to understand first and foremost the power that you have. See, I made this statement yesterday with with Washington, with, with White House politics as it is. Um, people's I, House, People's House. The, yeah, yeah, the People's House, um, Donald Trump, Jeff Sessions, his administration, you know, my former United States Senator, uh, they understood that their collusion with uh, Russian government to uh, affect the US election was very complicated, involved in something that uh, would require a great deal of work to unearth. But what they underestimated was the power of people to resist and persist to, to, to ensure that an investigation would happen. And that's the only way that we got to this point. I'm here to tell you that you as black medical practitioners have that same power to move policy that will affect communities just like mine. And you also have in people like me, a safe space to practice exactly what it is that you want to do that you think will be effective to create these models to change systemically lives, the quality of life, and the imbalance in healthcare. And so, my, 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 I guess my question would be. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> my question would be, um, what would be your best practice uh, tips, or what would be uh, your pointed suggestions on how people in this room right now can use their role in the healthcare space uh, to make measurable, quantitative, qualitative impact in these communities, using their voice and the power that they have. Well, thank you. I think I gave them several tips, and I would just reinforce, number one, your role as lobbyists. And not just to call them, but also write. Letters are more impactful than calls. And tell the story. Tell the story. I mean, write a letter that's thoughtful and more than a sentence, and that tells a story. I'm treating so-and-so who has long, who did not have health insurance, has a pre-existing condition, who may be affected by this rule. So uh, that's one thing I would say. Secondly, I've, I've said and I'll say again, that your doctor's offices also need to be education centers. That there's material that's available so that people can read it, although some of them are not gonna read it, you know that. And at three, when you treat people, you treat the whole person. 
so that you're looking at all the things. If you see somebody with bad teeth, tell them, look, those teeth are affecting other aspects of your health. You know, those crooked teeth and with all that white stuff in them, that's affecting aspects of your health. So those would be some of the things that I would put out there. And young man, you are a very effective mayor. You remind me of them other Howard mayors like Roz Baraka and that Kareem. Y'all all know how to talk. <laughs> and I would just add a couple of points. It is also important that we and all of our constituents register and get out and vote. Yes. 2018 is a banner year. We need to show up at the polls. So again, all register polls polls. and <laughs> yes, all souls to the polls. Make sure that you're there and doing that. Next question. Hello, and thank you for your wonderful speech. And I, I'm Dr. Sydney Ross Davis. I'm the immediate past chair of the physician executive section for the National Medical Association. And our section tries to concentrate on what docs can do, what docs can do to be better at business, what docs can do to be better at process and policy, what docs can do to be better at who they want to be when they grow up, no matter if they're little young docs or they're older me docs. So one of the things we, uh, myself and my other co-chair, Rose, uh, have, uh, have questions on is we recognize when we gave the uh, session for the Philadelphia, where we brought in our Congress people and we talked about healthcare disparities, that not only are we losing physician, uh, uh, black students coming into college, we're at one of the lowest rates in, since 1970, I think. We're losing uh, black physicians. We're there. We, we are not gaining as far as healthcare disparities. Even when we're getting in medical schools, we're not getting internships. And that means it's a difference in how we deliver health care in our communities. Because knowing and loving your community changes how you deliver care. It, our, our patient population needs to know you understand them, that, they, that you love them, that you want them to get better, and then they begin to do it. So the question I have is this. We have a voice, but most docs don't have the time to figure out how to use that voice to begin to be the anti-Tom Price, or the mm. anti, um, what's the gentleman from Louisiana who is saying, Cassidy, who's saying that oh, this cool. new yeah. um, um, bill does not take away uh, protections when it absolutely it does. does. Yeah. So what can we do to make sure that our, our the physicians who are treating the at-risk community and treating ourselves understand what's at risk, understand what they do, and how, understand how they reach out. Because I think sometimes we have our, all of our docs have their heads buried into the process of delivering care, they don't, that they don't really know how to protect the care they're delivering. So um, if we are able to come up with like a really quick bullet point checklist that people won't throw into the round um, filing cabinet that says this is what you need to do. I don't care if you're Republican, I don't care if you're Democrat, I don't care if you're independent, well I do, but um, it doesn't matter for this. I, I care whether or not you care about how to get better stuff for your patients. And to be the voice of I'm not in here for the greed, I'm not here for the, the anti-healthcare, anti-primary care agenda, I'm here for healthcare delivery in our communities. How do we get them to to reach out, what do we tell them to say? Who do they reach out? We need a real quick, simple, good night moon kind of book about it. You know what I'm saying? Well, yeah, I think you're in a perfect place with the National Medical Association under the leadership of Dr. Doris Brown. I think you're really in a place to ask her, and I help her if she wants me to, to, to put those kind of bullet points out there. I'm sure you are connected on the internet and that can just go out and um, periodically. Just to remind folks, I know that you know, they're local chapters, and I think that you know, bringing in speakers who can raise some of those points, some local health activists who may not be physicians, but they're health activists, is also very useful. But you, you touched on a couple of things that I want to roll back, and I'm, it, it was in my notes, but I didn't go there. But I, but, but I probably need to. We are losing black doctors. African Americans represent less than 2% of the medical profession. Um, about 2% of the dental profession. Less than 2% of teachers. 
Right. And, yes. and, and, you know, the question we have to ask is why is that? And there are two things. Um, one is what's happening with undergraduate education and STEM. Um, and so we've got to make sure that at our elementary schools, at our high schools, folks are more STEM literate. Um, I want to be a doctor, actually, but I can't stand the sight of blood, not even my own. So I decided, may I do something else? Um, but I did the math thing and all that, but I was like, mm, I don't know about this. But you know, there are young people who should have the opportunity to intern in your office, even if they're just doing reception work on, in the summer, so that they can see what a practice looks like. Your practice is a business, and that's why many doctors don't have time to do all the other stuff, because they're running a business. But what I would say is that we have to look at undergraduate admissions, and then we have to look at the politics of these med schools, because this is as much about politics as anything else. And when um, I had a student at Bennett who was a 4.0, a 4.0 chemistry major, and this system they have where you put your stuff in and da da da, she did not get one, one request to apply, not a single one. Um, so she ended up doing a fifth year at Meharry, and then she did get in, but she was of the quality that should have been admitted directly after undergraduate school. And many young people would not have taken the fifth year. That was expensive. Her parents paid for it. But the question some of you may ask your alma maters is what are they doing with recruitment and HBCUs? Uh, because many folks look down their nose at HBCUs when we deliver the same kind of education and sometimes a better education than PWIs because we pay attention to our students. We care about our students. We take them by the hand. I mean, when I was president of Bennett, yeah, I ate the calf twice a week. Now it almost killed me. And I didn't eat much, I ate salad. But the point is that I could see who was in the calf and who wasn't in the calf. And I might say to a young sister who came by my office, oh, you weren't in the calf yesterday. Um, what did you have for dinner? And people thought I was nosy, I am. Um, <laughs> that's why I've been a, an award-winning journalist, because I'm nosy. But, um, but it also is a way of just sort of checking in. What are you eating? Are you isolating yourself? Those kinds of things. So we, so, but, but so many of the med schools, and we only have, you know, Howard, Meharry, and uh, Morehouse. Well, we have Drew, and then uh, and Morehouse, we have four. They can't take everybody who wants to be a doctor. Uh, you could send folks to Cuba, but that probably ain't gonna turn out right. Um, uh, but anyway, all I'm saying is, you all need to be actively engaged in, in, in enrolling young people in the possibility of being physicians, of being, uh, if not physicians, in the medical community in other ways. I, when I broke my arm and they had to reset it, blah, blah, um, there was only one African-American occupational therapist at GW, one. And that other lady was crazy. So I, I, just, I told them, I said, I don't like her. I'm gonna wait for the sister. They said, well, she has a long waiting list. I said, oh, well. And then they asked me, was I a racist? I said, probably. Um, but let's not worry about it. I want the sister to deliver my health care. Um, I'm not dealing with that crazy white lady who keeps telling me to squeeze the ball when my can don't move. Um, you know? And then look and told me I was lazy. I'm like, no, I'm not lazy. I'm ticked. You know? But anyway, we need to get our folks into those professions. And you're the best people to spread that word. So stay on, Doris. She'll do it. She says it's a one-year term. Y'all could re-elect her. Uh, can they do that? Let me get we'll out y'all. Let question. me get out y'all's Kool-Aid. Good, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I actually have more of a comment. My name is Dr. Fatima Cody Stanford. I um, practice internal medicine and pediatrics under the guise of obesity medicine at Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. I do want to um, thank you for acknowledging obesity as a major issue within our communities, but I do want to make a slight modification to your numbers. 60% of African-American women in the United States have obesity, meaning are clinically classified as having obesity. Another 20% wow. have overweight, which means that 80% of all African-American women in the United States have either overweight or obesity. So I just wanted to give the gravity of that and just make some modifications to that and really have no other specific feedback. I'm just, I just wanted Thank to get that. You. Thank you. You know what, so sorry, sister, I wonder, I'm 5'6", and I weigh 145 pounds. My BMI is like right on the, right on the corner. So it's like about 25.5, 26. Yeah, yeah, my BMI is yeah. right on the edge. Yeah. Um, I'm skinny. 
if I lost some more weight, people would think I had HIV. Well, uh, it, is, it is very interesting for patients that I work with, since I work with only patients that struggle with weight. Um, I find that more with our, our patients that um, they are more adverse to losing um, weight than my Caucasian patients by, by significant difference. Um, I have um, older African-American women that tell me they're losing too much of their butt and how do I, how do I make them mm -hmm. stop that? And I, I really don't have a good answer for that. Um, yes. So um, <laughs> I'm just using the definitions that we have. And I do think there's some modifications that are necessary to really capture the difference in body type. We have more subcutaneous adipose tissue in African-Americans, meaning we carry it more in the hip, buttock, and thigh region versus Caucasians that carry more viscerally, which means in the midsection. So there are some differences, um, but you know, just wanted to acknowledge that. No, well, yeah. thank you. And you know, like yeah. what I, I deliberately lost 20 pounds about 10 years ago when I was diagnosed with diabetes because mm -hmm. they said if I lost the weight it helps that my numbers would come down. Mm -hmm. I, I could not tell you how bad my family talked about it. Don't nobody want a bone but a dog, you know? This was See, my it's, mama. It's, it's part who, of our cultural upbringing. So, yeah, so we need to shift this that This was a my bit. mama who don't even believe. I don't think you that look her, bony, okay? <laughs> well, that's what, well, you, 20 years ago, I had 20 more pounds on me. Okay. So, you know, and I can say, I, I deliberately went to lose weight, and right. my whole family talks about me like a total, okay. I mean, at Thanksgiving. I'll tell them to call me up. They start we'll putting food on my plate. Why yeah. don't you eat? I'm like, first of all, I can't eat all that. Right. Try. Right. I'm like, why? Eat. It's okay. Because it'll make, my mother said, it'll make me feel better to know that you're not undernourished. Oh, wow. I'm like, uh, moms, I weigh 145 pounds. That's a healthy weight. So anyway, I, I, will, I will ask you yes. to think about how, this, how these height weight charts should be modified for our community so that the people... Only, the only issue is, is that even though we carry less visceral adipose, which is that um, in the midsection, we do have much higher levels of non-alcoholic fat, fatty liver disease, which is the number one reason we're going to more transplants here in the United States for liver disease. So there is a little bit of a conflict. Do we shift the charts up or do we keep them the same because our likelihood of having issues like fatty liver disease and needing liver transplant secondary to the fat uptake in our liver because it becomes NASH, which is a gotcha. disease process is much higher than those that are Caucasian. So there's a little bit of a discrepancy. Yeah. Thank you. This right, is a great. short question because we have our afternoon section. Absolutely. So first of all, thank you for your, for your comments. I wanna just make a call actually for population health and so really appreciate the work that you're speaking of in terms of a call for action. So one of the pieces you spoke about, you know, advocacy, um, we know MACRA, and I just really want to put a, a word out for the quality payment program. Many doctors that may be receiving Medicare Part B, please make sure October 1st is that deadline. We're here to provide you free consultation around that. So I'm just kind of saying this to the audience around QPP, the, like the doctor said, you don't have the time to study what CMS is doing. We're here to help you with that. So I just really wanted to make a shout out. Please, we're here in action with the NMA. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you all so very much. And I look forward to learning that y'all have been sending letters to members of Congress that when you're here in Washington, some of you who are not from Washington are visiting with your members of Congress. And I know that Dr. Brown will coordinate some of that work because it's really important for them to hear from us about these health issues. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, we will have a, a Hill Day in March when we are doing our colloquium, um, engaging all of our collaborative partners. This afternoon, we have two concurrent sessions going on for every hour, so pick whichever one you would like. You can have the opportunity of attending two. They are various topics, all very important. We'll talk about physician reimbursement. We'll talk about obesity. We'll talk about uh, sickle cell and connective tissue disorders, um, and I'm blocking on what the others are, but they're listed in your program, and please enjoy yourselves. And again, thanks to Dr. Malvo. This is wonderful. And yes, you can have a teaspoon of mac and cheese. <laughs> yes.